Thank you so much. Uh, that's that's very kind, and uh, it's been it's been a real um, honor and a privilege uh, to get to know Bill and, and work together on these projects. So um so thank you for inviting me here. I um, uh, this is a, a new kind of audience for me, and uh, I've put together a talk that I haven't given before. So let's uh, let's see, let's see how it goes. Uh, by the way, if if anybody's interested afterwards in the details, all of the sort of official peer-reviewed kind of stuff, the software, the the papers, every, everything is here. And then here are sort of a little bit more um, personal thoughts about what I think it all means and and, and things like that. So so let's begin um, here. This is a well-known uh, painting. It's called uh, "Adam Names the Animals in the Garden of Eden," and there are two interesting things about this uh, this old story. Um, one of them, I think, is uh, needs to really be redone and, and, and ditched, and the other one is very profound, and I think uh, we're, it's gonna be important for us going forward. The one that needs to be dropped is this idea here that there are discrete natural kinds of beings. We, we know what they are. Here, here are the, uh, these, these large, uh, mostly cute uh, uh, sorts of animals. Uh, there's, there's Adam. Uh, we, we know what they are. They're discrete. They're different from each other. Adam, of course, is different from all of them. And uh, that, that, as you're going to see um, in a minute, is, uh, is, is, does not do justice to the incredible plasticity of, of life. Our, our attempts to bin it into these categories is, is not going to fly. Um, what is really profound here, I think, is that in that original story, um, you may or may not know that uh, n neither God nor the angels were able to name the animals. It was Adam that had to do it. The job was on him. And there are a couple of reasons why that might be. One is because in these old um, traditions, naming something or discovering the name of something means you've discovered something about its true inner nature. And I think that's important because we, are, we as humans are going to have to uh, discover the inner nature of a very wide set of beings that uh, Adam could not even have uh, begun to dream of. The other thing is, of course, Adam's the one that has to, li uh, has to live with them. And so his understanding of his world and the other beings around it is, uh, is going to be critical for, for him to develop. So I want to talk about a few things uh, today. Uh, first is uh, some, some uh, thoughts on information, evolution, and selves, this notion of collective intelligence and, and where it comes from. Um, I want to talk about the paradox of change and how biology handles it. Now, the paradox of change can be said uh, as follows. This is sc scaled to the uh, level of evolution, but I think you will see the um, obvious implications for personal and, and possibly um, you know, company growth and things like that. Um, the paradox is this. If, if, if you're a species and you fail to change, you're going to go extinct. But if you do change, you likewise will, in an important sense, cease to exist. So what does that mean? How do we as beings uh, preserve ourselves in some sense as we uh, inevitably change? We change physically, we change mentally. If you don't change mentally, you can't learn. So there's some sense in which a profound educational process changes you so that you're not the same. Certainly growing up will do that and so on. So, so this, is, this is a really um, interesting paradox and, and I'm going to show you how, how I think biology handles it. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about a few other topics, uh, such as uh, plasticity, um, diverse intelligence, and creative interpretation, a.k.a. polycomputing, that uh, biology uses across scales. And we're going to uh, look at it, begin, we're going to start our, our journey here through the eyes of a frog with an, with an eye on its butt. Now, um, if anybody asks you in the future, have you ever seen a frog with an eye on its butt? Now you can say yes. This is a frog uh, we have made in our, uh, in our lab. This is not Photoshop. This is not uh, AI. This is, um, this is a real eye on its butt. And the reason that these kinds of things are possible is because biology uh, commits to a certain kind of creative process to solve this problem. Um, the, way, the way that frog came to be is that we took a tadpole. So here's a tadpole. Here's the brain, the nostrils, the mouth, the gut, the tail. And what we did was we put some eyes, uh, some eye cell precursor cells um, on the back of this tadpole. Uh, the cells go ahead and they make an eye. Um, I'll tell you another story about ectopic eyes in a minute, but, but this, that's how we did this is by uh, transplantation. Um, you'll also note that um, he doesn't have any primary eyes, so we prevented those from forming, but we put an eye on his tail. And then we built this machine. This, is, this was an incredible ordeal. Uh, it took probably five years, about a million bucks, to, uh, for which, it, which is huge for a lab, uh, to, um, to build this kind of thing. And what the machine does is uh, test these tadpoles in visual assays. So basically, there's a little spot of light, and they have to either chase or stay away from um, the moving light in order to, um, uh, to, to uh, succeed in that, in that task. And we found out that they can see quite well. Right? These eyes on their backs enable them to see perfectly well. Um, by the way, here's the optic nerve. You can trace it. It does not go to the brain. It goes to the spinal cord, and then it stops there. So 
notice what's happened here is that this animal has a radically different sensory motor architecture. You've got now this weird itchy patch of tissue on your back that's sending signals to your spinal cord. How does the brain know that that's visual data and use it? And in particular, why doesn't that take extra uh, evolutionary cycles? You know, cycles of mutation, selection. It's just ready to roll. You've, you've, you've drastically changed this architecture that's been the same for millions of years, and suddenly it works. And it works because evolution doesn't actually make uh, specific solutions to specific problems. It makes problem-solving agents. And... Um, uh, embryos, as I'll point out in a few minutes, can't take much for granted. They solve these things on the fly, which is why this works. Now, um, what this has to do with collective intelligence is this. We, uh, we all uh, started life right here as a single, um, as a single cell. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I once uh, pointed out to somebody, I was, I was doing some, uh, some expert witness work, and, and they were trying to, um, one of the attorneys was trying to, uh, say that our work in frog was not relevant to humans, and he said, and, and he said, don't frogs come from an egg? And I said, well, you come from an egg, and and this was like everybody thought I was insulting him. You know, the judge banged the thing, and but 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 let's remember, we all come from an egg. We all come from a single cell, and that's a little blob of chemistry and physics, um, and that slowly and gradually uh, gives rise to one of these remarkable morphologies. And there is no magic uh, uh, spot, uh, no no lightning flash that says, okay, you were physics, but now you're a real cognitive individual now now mind comes into the picture this is slow and gradual so we then as scientists uh, and and philosophers do need to understand how does that scaling work how do you get from a system that's well described by chemistry and physics uh, and as I'll and as I'll, I'll mention actually uh, not not with zero cognitive capacity it's small but it's not zero um, how do you get here and let's remember that we humans with our uh, magical um, agential glow are not uh, discreetly different from all of these other things. We stand at the intersection of two um, enormous uh, uh, continuums where you can uh, both both evolutionarily and uh, developmentally, and then you know through biological change and through technological change, there are all kinds of interesting beings that um, we're going to need to get to know. So. Um, that's a little disturbing, and a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, they send me emails about how disturbed they are to find out that uh, they were basically a scale up from a from a single cell. But at least, at least we're a true unified intelligence, right? So, like, we're not like a um, collection of ants or, or termites or something that you can you can talk about an ant colony as a collective intelligence. But we're an actual true unified intelligence, right? Well, they're wrong. So. Um, this is uh, this is Descartes, who really liked the pineal gland, and the reason he liked the pineal gland is that there's only one of them in the brain, and he felt that our unified human experience should uh, be associated with a structure in the brain that's uh, unique, not not the bifurcated, not two like the hemispheres or all these other structures. It should be the only one. Well, if he had had access to good microscopy, he would have looked inside the pineal gland and he would have seen that wait a minute, there's not one of anything. It's made of a bunch of cells. Each one of these cells has all this stuff in it. So look at look at this 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 is all the, these are all the things that are inside of uh, each cell, and there's plenty more. This is only what we know to stain um, at this point, and so all intelligence is collective intelligence. We are all built of uh, a kind of uh, multi-scale agential material. This is a single cell. This happens to be a free living organism known as a lacrimaria. But look, this is what a single cell can do. Uh, there's no brain. There's no nervous system. Uh, he's handling all of his uh, local uh, local needs. Uh, with uh, and this is this is real time, so incredible anatomical, physiological, and um, uh, 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 metabolic control, and and so on. And so we're all made of collections of these. And the thing about being a collective intelligence is that you need cognitive glue. Now, what I mean by that is here's here's a rat that's been trained to uh, press a lever, get a reward. There is no single cell here that has had both experiences. So the cells at the bottom of the feet interacted with the lever. The cells in the gut got the delicious uh, sugar reward. But no single cell had both of these experiences. So who owns the associative memory? Who is it that knows that these two things are tied? It isn't any individual cell. It is the rat. So you've got this. You've got uh, what, you, what you need is a set of, uh, a set of mechanisms that uh, are able to uh, provide this uh, the system with memories, preferences, goals, and other cognitive properties that the individual parts don't have. Now that now now we're used to thinking about ones like this, and and uh, creatures like this are fairly um, there. You know, you, the rat doesn't change too much, uh, but there are many other creatures that uh, show us something something really remarkable. So here are some flatworms, some planaria. 
you can train them. Uh, you can you can train them to understand that these little bumpy circles that they that the, we've uh, laser etched into the bottom of the dish are where they get fed. So the liver shows up on these little circles. Uh, the other amazing thing about planaria is that they regenerate. So you can cut them into pieces. The record is something like 276 pieces. And uh, if you cut them in half here, this, t this tail will sit there doing nothing for about eight days. It'll grow a new head, and then behavior begins, and you find out that these animals remember the original information. Okay, so the information is not exclusively in the brain because you can cut off the entire head. Uh, it is somewhere else. It is, however, it is imprinted onto the new brain as it develops. And so you can do all kinds of interesting thought experiments like the old malfunctioning transporter, and ask, okay, if we cut them into pieces, who's the original planarian and so on. So right away you get into these issues of personal identity. You get into uh, w where is behavioral information? How does it move through the body? How does it imprint it onto new brains? How do brains know how to interpret? Just like you sh I showed you in the tadpole, the brain knows how to interpret information coming off of its spinal cord. Um, how does this brain know that whatever the tail is, is, is uh, telling it is actually uh, behavioral information that the brain can use. But it goes, it goes even beyond that. It's not just about maintaining the information. Um, here's a, uh, one of my favorite examples. So, so here's a caterpillar, two-dimensional. You can model it as a soft-bodied robot with a particular um, controller and uh, that, that's suitable for moving soft bodies that have no hard elements, so you can't push on anything. So, so these things crawl around and they eat leaves and they have a brain that's well suited for that. They have to turn into this. This is a butterfly that flies in three-dimensional uh, space, doesn't eat leaves, he, he drinks nectar. And in order to change the brain from this to that, you basically undergo this remarkable transformation process that dissolves most of the brain. Many of the cells die, most of the connections are broken. But what you find out is that if you train the caterpillar to, uh, fi to uh, seek out leaves on a particular color um, disc, the butterfly will do the same. Now there's a few amazing things here. You know, you can ask questions like, what's it like to be a creature in the process of changing so radically, right? And so uh, questions like that. And you can ask, where is the memory? If the brain is being refactored, where does it keep those memories? But there's a, there's a deeper issue here, which is that uh, butterflies don't eat the same stuff that, um, that caterpillars eat. And they don't move the same way that caterpillars move. So having the exact memories of a caterpillar is completely useless. What it does, what it has to do actually is interpret whatever the engrams, whatever the memory uh, traces that the caterpillar leaves, it has to reinterpret them for its new context. So in its new higher dimensional life, it doesn't carry the exact memories of its previous life, but it carries the deep lessons that it's learned. And the trick here is uh, that it has to know how to um, uh, remap them onto its own uh, architecture. So, so you can read a lot more about this in this, uh, in this preprint that, um, that I just put up a few days ago. So um, you, the, the interesting thing is that uh, these, these, these worms and caterpillars and so on, uh, we, we, we shouldn't just think about them as this uh, you know, sort of bizarre aspect of biology that has nothing to do with us. Because if you think about um, the, uh, the, the, the slices of our own life at any given moment, you don't have access to the past. The only thing you have access to are the, uh, the engrams, the, the traces of past experience that your past self has laid down in your brain and your body in notepads and various um, you know, outsourced uh, uh, kinds of things. You have to reinterpret those memories. At every point, you have to uh, reconstruct actively uh, the story of who you are, what you are, um, what your various commitments and beliefs are from the molecules and the uh, energy patterns that are in your body and you have to tell a story about what they add up to. This is what our brain does all the time. One way to think about this is that memories are messages from your past self, right? Just the way that you exchange messages laterally with other, with other um, beings at your current time point. They are, uh, these, pa these, uh, these memories are messages from a past self and like any act of communication, you're not actually required to interpret these messages in the way that the sender intended. You are free to reinterpret them however it's uh, best for you. And not only are you free to do that, you actually have to do that because you will change. Your body will change, the environment changes. Even for, even for humans, um, uh, uh, there's turnover, there's molecular turnover and cellular turnover all the time. So, so all of these messages have to be turned over. And the way that this works, you can imagine that these, um, these, these engrams, these, uh, these, these memory traces are like this, like this middle node, this, this narrow little middle node in, uh, in what the, this is probably familiar to many of you, this kind of um, um, uh, this, this, this architecture 
uh, that's used like an autoencoder kind of thing where it squeezes down um, all of the information that's come before because you don't want it to remember the exact data. You want it to remember patterns. And then you pass the bottleneck. You want this side to reinflate uh, those patterns into whatever makes sense on the other end. Biology has this everywhere in gene regulatory networks, in voltage at the center of bioelectrical circuits, in biomechanical uh, networks. This architecture is absolutely everywhere because uh, this is what enables uh, information to preserve salience, not accuracy, but salience and utility um, on the other end. Now, this will only work if the two ends of this thing are smart, right? Um, they have to be. They have to. Uh, uh, they have to take undertake some effort to to uh, uh, interpret and, and encode what's going on here. So um, our our bodies are uh, made of a multi-scale competency architecture. Every level of this is in fact smart in the sense that it has a competency to solve various problems. So. Uh, whole bodies, of course, solve problems in three-dimensional space, various kinds of uh, behaviors. But uh, your molecular networks, your subcellular organelles, your cellular um, uh, components, your organs, tissues, uh, all of these things solve problems in other kinds of spaces. And in fact, one thing that evolution has done is to pivot some of the same tools and, and tricks for navigating problem spaces across these various spaces. So we started off metabolic space and then physiological space and then genes came along and you could navigate gene expression space and then multicellularity came along and you could navigate anatomical space, the space of possible um, large scale um, shapes. And then of course brains and muscles showed up and you could do behavioral space and then eventually linguistic space. And it turns out um, from some, some recent work in our group that actually some of the exact same ideas from, from navigating these other spaces you can use to help uh, AIs navigate linguistic space and keep you know keep track of a of a of a story longer and longer and, and so on. So um, uh, Alan Turing, who obviously needs no introduction, uh, who was very interested in uh, minds and intelligence and different embodiments of intelligence and machines and so on, he was studying uh, intelligence through reprogrammability. Right, he was interested in programmable hardware and plasticity. Uh, interestingly. He wrote this paper, uh, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. It's one of the earliest works on the mathematics of how order might arise in uh, chemical systems, like that egg that I showed you. So he was interested, how, do you, um, how, how does the egg self-assemble? How, um, how do the chemicals uh, assume some sort of order? Now, why would, why would somebody who was interested in mathematics and computer science and so on be interested in this question? And I think that he saw a very profound uh, kind of... Um, invariance that, uh, that I think if he had lived longer, both biology and computer science would be much further along. Because what he realized was that the story of the appearance of minds is fundamentally uh, the same story as the story of the self-assembly of the body. Right? The, the, uh, the factors that put together your body should be uh, really uh, important for understanding where minds come from. So let's ask, where do anatomies come from? So you start life as a collection of embryonic blastomeres. This is a cross-section through an adult human. Look at the amazing order. All of the organs, they're the right size, the right shape. Everything is next to the correct thing. Where does this amazing order uh, come from? Where, where is this pattern uh, written down? And so if you ask even, even nine-year-olds, I've, I've given talks to uh, middle schoolers, and they will immediately say, well, it's in the DNA. It's in the genome. But um, the thing is that we can read genomes now. And actually, this was apparent long before, but now we know for sure because we can read genomes. None of this is directly in the genome. What's in the genome are the specifications of the proteins, the tiniest uh, hardware, the molecular hardware that cells get to have. This pattern, any more than the, the actual structure of the uh, termite colony or the precise uh, pattern of a spider web, are not in their genome. This is not directly in our genome either. Where this comes from is the working out of the physiological software uh, that, uh, that, that this hardware enables. And so we have to ask a number of questions. Uh, given that DNA specifies the hardware, where does the anatomy come from? How do cells know what to make and when to stop? Uh, if a piece is missing, people like us want to know how do you repair it? How do you make these cells, uh, to, how do you convince them to regrow what they need to regrow? And um, as engineers, we also ask, well, what else are they willing to do if we knew how to communicate with them? And I could do a whole thing here on um, the anatomical compiler and, and some, of those, uh, some of those ideas. Uh, but if we knew how to communicate with these cells, what else would, be, would they be willing to build? And I'm going to show you some of those at the, towards the end of the talk. Now, one cool thing about this process is that it's not hardwired. This is not simply the emergence of complexity. This is actually the emergence of intelligence. 
What kind of intelligence? Well, goal directedness of a certain kind in anatomical space. So here, this is an amazing creature, this axolotl. And they regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, uh, portions of the uh, brain and heart and so on. And if they lose a limb, and they do this all the time, they bite each other's legs off constantly, uh, wherever they lose the limb, it, the cells will work very hard to build exactly what's needed, and then they stop. And that's the most amazing thing about this process is they know when to stop. How do they know when to stop? Well, they stop when the correct uh, axolotl arm has been completed. It's a process of anatomical homeostasis. If you deviate them from their goal, they will get right back there, and then, uh, and then they stop. By the way, uh, this is not just for weird organisms. Um, uh, mammals are a little bit regenerative, so humans can regenerate their liver. Uh, kids uh, up to a certain age can regenerate their fingertips, okay? And deer uh, can regenerate bone and vasculature and innervation up to a centimeter and a half per day of new growth when they're doing this. Okay? So, so we have some of these capacities, but not terribly much. I want to show you one of my um, favorite examples of, um, of this kind of intelligence and, and what it means to, to be a, uh, a being coming into this world. This is a cross-section through a, a kidney tubule in the, um, in, the, in the newt. So normally it's made of 8 to 10 cells or so. But one trick you can do is uh, by uh, increasing the number of nuclei, uh, of, of actually of genetic material in these cells, you can make the cells much larger. So the cells will scale to the amount of genetic material, but the newt stays the same size. And the only way it can do that is by using fewer cells to build the same structure. Um, and uh, so, so the first amazing thing is that you could have extra copies of all your genetic material, no problems, everything still works. Second, you can have uh, huge cells and you will scale the number appropriately, no problem. The most amazing thing happens when you make truly enormous cells and at that point, uh, one cell will just bend around itself and give you that same lumen. Now this is a completely different molecular mechanism than this. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication, this is cytoskeletal bending. So this is top-down causation in the service of a particular journey in anatomical space that, the, that this system needs to make. It can use different tools in its disposal. It can use different molecular tools to get the job done. And we can ask all kinds of interesting questions about how did it know that that was the, the thing to do? Um, but, but just think about what it means to be a newt coming into this world. You can't depend on anything, never mind the environment, never mind the injury that somebody else might come along and, and, you know, and, and bite your leg off or something. Uh, you can't even count on your own parts. You don't know how, well, how many copies of your chromosomes you're going to have. You don't know what the uh, size of your cells are going to be. You don't know how many cells you're going to have. You have to come in and on the fly, you have, to, you, have to do, you have to take this journey in anatomical space and you can't overtrain on your evolutionary priors. You cannot assume any of the things that were true uh, in, in evolution going back, not just about the environment, but about yourself. So um, uh, a very long story, very short, we've been studying how all these things work. And what we basically found out is that the uh, capacities of brains and nervous systems for dealing with novelty, for intelligence, for navigation, for um, keeping memories and pursuing goals and all of that, uh, those capacities are actually incredibly ancient. They're driven by a kind of uh, electrophysiological software that is uh, produces, produced in the brain by these little ion channels. Uh, that, that set voltages and these voltages can propagate through the network and you get this electrical activity that uh, you can imagine going on in the brain. But that mechanism is extremely ancient. It's, it's not really specific to brains at all. Um, evolution discovered it about the time of bacterial biofilm, so very long ago. And uh, all cells have these ion channels. Most cells have these electrical synapses. Your whole body is a giant electrical network that has many of the capacities that your brain has, but it does them slower. So if you take almost any neuroscience paper and you just do a find replace, and in fact, we made an AI system to, um, to do just this uh, for people, it, it, it basically flips some words around. You know, if instead of neuron, you say cell, and instead of millisecond, you say hour, you basically get a pretty, a pretty reasonable developmental biology paper about how, uh, whereas your brain thinks about moving you in three-dimensional and now linguistic space, the rest of your body has been thinking about how to move you through anatomical space, from being an egg to being, you know, whatever, whatever we become. So um, I just want to show you a small piece of what happens when we understand something like this. This is this the, these electrical networks are literally the cognitive medium of the collective intelligence of your body cells. Whereas you are the product of the collective intelligence of your neurons, your body is the product of the collective intelligence of uh, the rest of your cells. Uh, behaving in anatomical space. And when we learn this interface, 
this bioelectrical interface, we get access to an API that's very, very powerful. Um, here's one example, and by the way, just to say, none of this has to do with applied electric fields. There are no electrodes, no magnets, no waves or frequencies or anything like that. We're hacking the natural interface that cells use to shape each other's behavior, which is the set of ion channels and um, uh, gap junctions on their surface. And so, so we can, we can um, for example, insert uh, some, some uh, potassium channel proteins here to create a particular voltage pattern. And that voltage pattern is a signal to these cells, and what these cells will do is build an eye. This is not like the eye I showed you before. That was a transplant. This is not like that. We have said to these cells, which normally make a gut, we've said, here's a particular voltage pattern. It's, it happens to be the same pattern that they normally use to make an eye. And the cells see it, and they build an eye. Okay? And these eyes, if you section them, have the same lens, retina, optic nerve, all this stuff. Now, notice a couple of interesting things. First of all, like any good subroutine call, we did not have to give it all the information on how to build an eye. In fact, we don't have any idea of how to build an eye. We don't know how to talk to all the stem cells, um, all the genes that are there that have to be turned on. The eye is very complex, and we don't want to. We want a high-level uh, uh, um, stimulus that prompts the cells to do what they already know how to do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, here, this is, this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a tadpole somewhere. The blue cells are the ones that we actually injected with our ion channel, but there's not enough of them to make an eye. And so what they've done is they've recruited all these other normal cells to participate with them to be an eye. And in fact, we've studied, there's a conversation that happens. These, these blue cells acquire a new belief. They, they believe that they should be an eye, and they tell all the other cells, hey, you, you should be working with us to make an eye. These other cells, actually, what are they saying? They're saying, no, we should be skin or gut or whatever. And so they have this back, back and forth con um, conversation, and sometimes these guys win and you get an eye, and sometimes the rest of the cells win and they um, ignore us and, and stay whatever tissue they're supposed to be. There are other um, collective intelligences like ants that do this when, you know, two ants uh, or a couple of ants discover um, something that it's too big for them to carry by themselves. They recruit their neighbors. So all these competencies, you know, this ability to hold a, um, a goal in anatomical space, to try to convince others of your goal, to get buy-in to, to your story about what should happen, and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose that battle. Um, all of these are native competencies of the tissue. We didn't have to build in any of that. It's already there. And in the planaria, um, I told you that they regenerate, and if you cut off the head and the tail, this middle piece will reliably regenerate this, uh, this, this normal worm with the right number of heads. Here's the bioelectric pattern memory. This is now, we're literally seeing the memories. Think of it as a brain scan, except not in the brain. We're literally seeing the, uh, the, the, the uh, representations in this tissue of how many heads a normal planarian should have. So we can go ahead and change them. We have the technology. Instead of one head, we can say, no, you should have two heads. And here's a perfectly normal animal has that, whose tissues, not, not the animal itself, not the brain, but the tissues, have been uh, incepted with a new form of memory, that, a, a, new, um, a new memory that says that if you should get cut into the f in the future, so this is a counterfactual, it's not true now, but if you get cut in the future, a proper worm should have two heads. And so if you cut that worm, this is what you get. And again, not Photoshop, um, these are real. So a, a, a single worm body, a perfectly normal and anatomically normal worm body can store at least two different ideas of what it will do in the future if it should happen to get injured. And the reason I call this a pattern memory, I mean, it's a memory of the collective intelligence of the body. The reason I call it a memory is because um, if you then go ahead and you cut these two-headed worms in, the, in, in perpetuity, uh, they maintain uh, two-headedness with no more change. And so this has all the properties of memory. It's stable, but it's rewritable. Um, by the way, not genetic. We haven't touched the genetics. The genetics are completely untouched. So, um, so the question of where is the uh, anatomy of this, uh, the, you know, the answer of the genome is not, uh, is not really the right answer. Yes, the genome encodes hardware that by default will say one head, but that hardware is reprogrammable, and here you can have these nice... Um, you can push it into, uh, into, this, uh, into this other state. And by the way, you could push it into a state belonging to other species. So this nice uh, triangular-headed planarian can make flat heads like a P. felina, round heads like an S. mediterranea. This hardware, again, with no genetic change, this is just by altering the bioelectrical uh, patterns that serve as the memory here, they will visit these other attractors in the uh, anatomical state space where these other creatures normally live, about 100 to 150 million years of evolutionary distance. But, um, and, uh, but, but, but that's okay, this, this, this hardware can, can, can visit there if, uh, if, if pushed. 
Um, and of course, uh, uh, not just the shape of the head, but, the, but actually the shape of the brain, the distribution of stem cells um, are all the same like these other species. So, so, so what we're seeing here is, the, first of all, the hardware-software distinction in biology, the reprogrammability of biology, the, um, the API, once you understand how uh, the cognitive glue works that, uh, that, that binds individual cells into a more global vision of what they should be doing, now you can start communicating with it, rewriting goals, uh, and, uh, and, and really collaborating with the material. This is, you know, I, I do a whole other talk on um, engineering with agential materials. This is not uh, metal and, 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 and Legos. This is an agential material. You're a collaborator with that material. You're not micromanaging it. So let's, let's think about um, where these cells come from. So, so here's a blastoderm. Let's say it's, uh, you know, 10 or 50,000 cells in the beginning. We look at that and we say, oh, that's one embryo. What are we counting when we say that's one embryo? What, what is there really one of? Well, what we're really counting is um, stories. We're counting how many different stories there are in this tissue that the cells are committed to as far as where they're going to go in anatomical space. We're counting commitment, and uh, they're aligned. All of these, under normal circumstances, all of these cells are aligned. They're, they've bought into one single story, and this is what they're going to build. That's what we mean when we say there's one embryo. Um, you might ask a similar question in the brain. If I showed you a human brain and you didn't know what a human was, you could ask, so how many individual cells fit here? Like, what's the density of cells per, um, you know, per unit volume of this, of this medium? In computers, we kind of have some idea of, of how much information fits into a certain number of uh, um, uh, transistors or whatnot. But, but, but here we actually don't know. And the amazing thing is that if you, uh, if you take this early embryonic blastoderm and use a, uh, use a needle, to scratch, um, put some scratches into it, and I used to do this in uh, duck embryos when, uh, when I was a grad student. Uh, what happens is that each of these little islands doesn't feel the presence of the others for a while until it heals up, and so it, it goes and, and self-organizes an embryo. And then you get conjoined twins like this, you can get triplets, you can get all sorts of things. And so uh, a couple of interesting things here. First of all, the number of individuals that come out of this excitable medium is not known in advance. It's certainly not determined by the genetics. It could be zero, one, probably up to half a dozen. So how many selves, how many individuals are really in there? Well, you don't know until they self-organize. And that process of self-organization is critical. One of the things they have to do is determine boundaries. Where do I end and the outside world begins? Or in this case, some other embryo begins. Actually, some of the cells at this um, intersection are a little confused. That's why uh, in conjoined twins, one of the twins will often have a laterality defect. We actually figured out why in the 96 for the first time why conjoined twins tend to have a, def a, a laterality a flipping in one of the twins, it's because these cells can't quite tell, am I the right side of this guy or am I the left side of this guy? But overall, they have to establish their boundaries. And uh, the analogy to the brain is actually still apropos because we have lots of examples of split brain patients, dissociative identity disorders, all of these kinds of things where it's entirely not obvious that, that our brain is host to just one uh, coherent self. And so, one way that, um, that I've been working on to, uh, to, uh, start, to start thinking about how to uh, understand uh, beings, um, goal-directed beings in very different embodiments is to uh, put aside the question of what are you made of or um, uh, whether you were engineered or evolved and really just to ask about the size of your goals, right? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the largest uh, goal you're capable of pursuing? And so that gives rise to this idea of a cognitive light cone. It's kind of like a Minkowski cone, except a little bit upside down. And so if you collapse a space onto this axis and time onto this axis, you can see that different kinds of creatures can have different uh, uh, sco uh, scopes to the goals that they can, um, that they can conceive of. And humans actually, maybe uniquely, their cognitive light cone is bigger than their own lifespan. And that may provide some for some interesting psychological pressures. If you're a goldfish, uh, you may have some goals 20 minutes into the future, but those goals are probably pretty achievable. It's very likely that you will live for, for the next 20 minutes. So, you know, all your goals are achievable. For many humans, they know their goals are guaranteed not achievable because they can see and commit to goals that are bigger than their known lifespan. Uh, so, so for, 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 ne for now, anyway, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that, uh, that makes uh, humans uh, kind of unique. And then, of course, we are all compound bodies of lots of little uh, subunits that have their own goals in various spaces that compete, cooperate, and uh, interact with each other. Now, this has uh, that, that kind of this, this, this crazy way of thinking about things as this, this cognitive light cone has uh, clinical implications. And I, I, I like this not just because I want to um, make advances in, in uh, biomedicine, but also because this is how we know 
that, uh, that, that, that some of this philosophizing is actually on the right track. So, so this, is, this is the tiny cognitive light cone of a single cell. All it really cares about is its local, uh, uh, the st you know, the states uh, locally here. Um, but what evolution did is scale it up via sort of mechanisms that I haven't really had time to talk about, but bioelectricity is one of them. It's, it's now, the cognitive light cone is huge. It's the size of this whole limb. Each, all of these cells, uh, they, they're not pursuing their own local agendas, they're pursuing this triangle. But that has a, um, a failure mode, and that failure mode is cancer. So once individual cells disconnect from the network, they roll back to their unicellular selves. Uh, they, or they, don't, they, can't, uh, they can't conceive of these grandiose goals anymore. All they can remember is proliferate as much as you can and eat as much as you can and go wherever life is good. And that is, uh, that this is a human glioblastoma. That's cancer. And so one of the things you might do then is, uh, is uh, to, to on this, on this uh, weird way of looking at things, is instead of targeting the genes or, or uh, worried about ge being worried about genetic uh, uh, defects or trying to kill these cells with toxic chemotherapy, you might say, well, what if we just uh, forcibly reconnect them to the rest of the organism? So here's a tadpole injected with a human oncogene, and the bioelectric imaging already tells you, yeah, here's the, the first thing that happens when these cells transform is they disconnect electrically from the rest of the body. They, they acquire this aberrant uh, voltage pattern. And if we co-inject an ion channel, it doesn't, doesn't kill the cells. In fact, you can see here, the, the, the red is the um, oncoprotein. It's very strong. In fact, it's all over the place. This is the same animal. There's no tumor. Because, because even though the hardware of these guys is, is a little screwy because they've got this, uh, this, um, uh, this oncoprotein, they're being forced to s informationally to be part of this continuum, and that, uh, that uh, causes them to be part of a collective intelligence that just builds nice organs. Now, again, we're able to do all this, make eyes and normalize tumors and induce leg regeneration in animals that don't regenerate and so on. Not because we're so smart or, or we're doing some kind of crazy synthetic biology. All we're doing is hacking the native competency of the tissue. And by the way, uh, oh, oh, and one other thing I wanted to say is that these cancer cells are not more selfish than normal cells. There's a lot of um, game theory that models cancer as being more selfish. I don't think they're more selfish. I think they have smaller cells. So you can be as selfish as you want as, as long as your, um, your cognitive light cone is large enough to uh, encompass many, possibly all, uh, uh, beings, and then and then you know then 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 it's fine. And so there's this there's this issue, and this is something that um, that, that Bill and, and our um, other uh, collaborators are are actually working on this this notion of increasing the, the um, uh, cone of compassion outwards. So uh, the interesting thing about us engineering all this is that we are not the only bioengineers. Um, this is another. This is a non-human bioengineer, and look, this is a this is an oak uh, leaf. And you might think that, um, well, acorns always make oak trees and these leaves. We know what the oak genome does, right? It makes these flat green things. But, but here comes this bioengineer. It doesn't change the genome. The hardware is perfectly capable. You don't need to rewire it. Uh, I don't have to explain to this crowd uh, why you, know, you don't use a soldering iron when you want to go from PowerPoint to Microsoft Word on your laptop. This, the, the, this, uh, this, this animal takes advantage of exactly that, which is that it lays down some signals that prompt the cells to build something completely different. This is made of the le of the plant cells, not the not the um, not the animal. Would we have any idea that these cells are capable of building something like this or like this, right? If we hadn't done this, uh, we would not. And so, for that reason, in our lab, um, we make a number of synthetic uh, creatures to really test the plasticity, um, the uh, the the ability of these of the, of the hardware to undergo novel um, novel scenarios. And um, this is uh, we call these um, xenobots. Because what, what happens here is that uh, some, some uh, skin cells are harvested from the top of a frog embryo. They self-assemble into this little thing, which I think is a biorobotics platform. And we are interested in knowing where their goals come from. So here you can see they swim. Um, they can go in circles. They can patrol back and forth. They have collective behaviors. Here's one going through, um, through a maze. So it comes down this, uh, this arm of the maze. Over here, it's going to take a turn without um, bumping into the opposite wall. So it takes a turn. And at this point, uh, due to some internal uh, who knows why, it, it turns around and goes back where, it's came, where it came from. Uh, remember, this is just skin, OK? There's no, there's no nervous system. There's, there's nothing in there. Um, one amazing thing they do is kinematic replication. So if you provide them with um, loose skin cells, they will uh, run around and combine them into these little these little piles and, and work them and polish them. And because they're working with an agential material, for the same reason we were able to do this, not because we know how to, uh, how to uh, change the way these cells behave, but we liberated them into a new context. 
And these little piles mature into the next generation of xenobots. And guess what they do? They run around and they make the next generation and the next. This is basically von Neumann's dream of a, of a, of a robot that makes copies of itself from materials it finds in the environment. And so if you ask what does a frog genome know, well, it certainly knows how to do this, how to make this developmental, the hardware that goes through this developmental sequence and, um, and then has these, these kind of behaviors. There's some tadpoles. But apparently it also can do this. And the amazing thing is that there's never been any xenobots. There's never been any evolutionary pressure to be a good xenobot. Where did all this come from? Why is there this weird developmental stage of this xenobot? This is an 80-year-old, 80 80-day-old uh, 80 xenobot. It's changing into something. We have no idea what. They have their own behaviors. They do this kinematic replication that no one else, uh, as far as we know, no other organism does. Uh, so, so this is really the thing. When, when you make um, or when you facilitate novel collective intelligences that have never been here before, and that includes uh, financial structures, social structures, um, Internet of Things, who knows? We, we make these things all the time. We really don't know where, uh, where their goals come from, what their goals are going to be, what their uh, capacity for problem solving is going to be. Um, we need to understand. And lest you think that this is some special, I mean, these, these cells come from an amphibian. They come from an embryo. You might think, nah, amphibians are plastic. Uh, embryos are pretty plastic. This is probably some, some crazy embryonic cell thing. Well, um, here is uh, this little creature. If I asked you what you thought this was, you might think we got it off the bottom of a pond somewhere. Uh, if you were to sequence its genome, you would see 100% uh, Homo sapiens. This is, these are human cells. They come from an adult human patient, no embryo stuff. Adult human tracheal epithelial cells. Uh, they make something we call anthrobots. Um, we, uh, this is a type of agential intervention because these uh, anthrobots, uh, remarkably, we found a, a, um, a novel capability. The capability is, and I'm sure there are many others, it's just the first thing we found, is that if you played a bunch of human neurons and you scratch them, so you make a wound right here, these anthrobots will uh, traverse down the wound and when they settle down, what they'll do is uh, they start knitting the two sides together. They heal uh, this, uh, this, uh, this neural defect. And so um, who would have known that your tracheal cells, which sit there quietly in your airway for decades, if you, if you take them out and you uh, let them uh, have a new life, reboot their multicellularity, have a new life in the new environment, they become this little motile creature that can run around, by the way, can be injected back into your body. There's no immune suppression needed because it's your own cells. It shares all the priors with your own tissues about what health and disease are, what cancer is, what inflammation is. And among other things, what they can do is they can actually repair neural defects. And so, so that's just kind of the, the biomedical side of things. But, but more fundamentally, and I'm, I'm just about done. I know I'm, I'm over time a couple of minutes. Um, uh, just fundamentally, what we see is that what, what I think these are, and this is not a con this is not the conventional you know view of my colleagues. I don't think, but th but what I think we're looking at in all of these examples is uh, vehicles for exploring a platonic space or a latent space of possibilities. When we ask where do the shape uh, and and behavior of xenobots, of anthrobots, of other chimeras and other weird things that we make, where do they come from? Well, evolutionary selection is not where they come from. And I think that what normal embryos do is uh, exploit a little pinprick, a one single point of interface between this platonic space and the physical world, and you get your standard reliable uh, um, uh, body. But, but what we can do is we can start to enlarge these little holes by making anthrobots and xenobots and other things. Uh, we can start making uh, holes and, and looking around and starting to... Uh, uh, understand the structure of that space. What else is out there? I, I really think that what we're studying here is, uh, is the structure of this, uh, of this space that's around us and, and still very poorly understood. So um, just, uh, just a couple things to, uh, to finish up here. First of all, um, here's what I think the biology teaches us. Everything is going to change. Your body's going to change, your parts, the environment, everything is going to change. It's futile to try to hold on to um, specific details. Be and, and in particular, biology uses an extremely unreliable material. Everything uh, is um, uh, within within a cell is going to go bad. Uh, there's there's huge amounts of noise. It's it's exactly the opposite of what we do in computers, where we make very reliable parts and we try to uh, insulate each level from the level below. You don't you know you you just sort of assume the level below is going to work, and then and then that's how we program. That is the opposite of what biology does. Biology assumes the material is going to go wrong in a million ways, whether you're a genome. Um, uh, whether you're, you're a genome that has to be reinterpreted by the species as it changes, you, you know your parts are going to change, you're going to be mutated, uh, and your environment will change, you have to reinterpret it. Brains do the same uh, as they change over time, they reinterpret their memories. 
uh, intelligence is everywhere. That's because the only way to do this kind of this kind of thing, this uh, committing to salience as opposed to uh, accuracy, means that intelligence has to be everywhere. Every part of the body has to be able to reinterpret, uh, confabulate, tell stories, uh, new stories about um, what it saw and and what information it has to uh, solve whatever the uh, the new problems are. This is polycomputing, which uh, which uh, Josh Barnegard and I work out work on the idea that. Uh, Biology uh, has uh, is 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 just a, a, a huge collection of systems which interpret and reinterpret each other's computations in different ways. The exact same computation means different things to different observers. So it's an observer-focused um, view. You can't say what is it really computing. And from that perspective, each self is a is an uh, a dynamic construction. It's an ongoing process of sense making of your own memories and the environment, and it's self-reinforcing. Um, these are uh, these are these are basically uh, points of view. These are re self-reinforcing, uh, continuously uh, modifying um, points of view that seek to perpetuate themselves by making sense of whatever's going on now. And this is this is a very uh, deep idea from William James, where he said thoughts are the thinkers. Uh, if we sort of dissolve the idea, the distinction between um, data and machine, right, and we and we think that the pattern itself is actually helping uh, construct its niche, so it's constructing the cognitive system within which it will prosper, then, then all of us are really um, very complex bundles of, of thoughts that have sort of closed the loop and learned to um, contribute to their own persistence within various physical cognitive systems. And because biology is so interoperable, because biology solves all of this on the fly, it doesn't, doesn't assume anything, uh, pretty much any combination of evolved material designed or engineered material and software is some kind of viable agent. So we already have some cyborgs and we're gonna have lots more and there are hybrots and chimeras and all kinds of just different um, bodies and minds where all of Darwin's endless forms, most beautiful on earth, are a tiny little dot in this uh, enormous uh, option space of new bodies and new minds. So, so, these, um, the, the, so, so the need now for a new ethical synthbiosis is clear. This, uh, this old idea that we can decide how we're going to relate to something based on what does it look like and how did it get here? Did it come from a factory or was it naturally evolved by random processes of evolution? Those two criteria are going to be out the window. Uh, we're going to have to deal with beings that are nowhere on the tree of life with us that don't offer us easy um, uh, answers the way that, uh, for example, current uh, AIs do when, you know, you can, you can kind of distinguish them strongly from, uh, from biology, but, but boy, uh, we're going to be surrounded by, by beings that are uh, composites and, and none of those um, answers will be um, so, so trivial. And uh, this is uh, Jeremy Gay, um, is an amazing graphic artist who drew this for me. This is kind of a new version of Adam uh, and, the, uh, and the Garden of Eden because uh, we've got our, our job cut out for us, but it's, it's going to be an amazing journey because we are finally going to, I hope, uh, get better at uh, detecting and, and, and relating to um, very diverse minds all around us. So I'm going to stop here. If you're interested in uh, any of this stuff, um, it's uh, discussed in various uh, papers here. Um, these are the um, people I want to thank. A uh, number of uh, postdocs uh, and PhD students uh, gave, that, that did the work that I showed you today. Um, lots of our um, collaborators. Uh, these are the, the people who fund us. Um, disclosures. So these are three spin-off companies for my group that have um, funded our work. And most thanks of all to the actual um, animals that we deal with. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening.